The most outstanding thing I came across this week was the existence of a man by the name of Colonel Luigi Palma de Cesnola. After fighting in three of the 19th century's most significant wars spanning two continents, he amassed a collection of 35,000 antiquities from his treasure-hunting escapades on the island of Cyprus, and 5,000 of them sank to the depths of the ocean and remain there to this day. Here's his story. And remember to like and subscribe to see more content just like this. Colonel Luigi Palma de Cesnola was born to a Piedmontese count and military officer in 1832. In 1848, at the tender age of 15, Cesnola joined Piedmont Sardinia's army. This just so happened to be the same year that the First Italian War of Independence started, so lucky him. Now, believe it or not, just a year later, at the age of 16, he'd become a second lieutenant on account of his bravery during a battle. I mean, most guys' main concern at the age of 16 nowadays is asking Stacy out on a date. But this guy's main concern was not getting his ass impaled by an Austrian bayonet. And just a handful of years later, he participated in yet another war, the Crimean War, as an aide-de-camp of a general. Afterwards, he came to New York, and after teaching Italian and French for a bit, he somehow jumped to founding a military academy. And he also married the daughter of a war hero who helped design the Stars and Stripes. I know it sounds like I'm making this all up, but Cesnola just had a pretty extraordinary life. But this would not be the end of his military career, because right then the Civil War happened. He became a colonel of the 4th New York Cavalry Regiment. But apparently he was not a model officer, having been accused of stealing property, and at one point, at the start of the Battle of Aldi in 1863, he was even arrested and got his saber taken away by his superior officer for protesting against some guy less experienced than him being promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. The outset of a major battle doesn't exactly seem to be the most opportune time to arrest someone, but I'm sure Cisnola's superior officer knew much better than me. Apparently not being promoted to Brigadier General was a real hang-up for Cisnola throughout his life. He never wound up being made a Brigadier General, but his tombstone refers to him as one anyway. He didn't give a crap. Anyways, while he was under arrest, his cavalry regiment refused to charge up a hillside gun battery. I wonder why. Cisnola was free because he was the only man who could rally them to charge, so his superior officer freed him and reportedly even gave Cisnola his own saber to replace the one he had just taken away. So Cisnola went from being an inmate to leading a cavalry charge within minutes, and apparently he turned the tide of the battle. He was given the Medal of Honor for this, but after its conclusion he was found lying under his horse with a sword wound and a gun wound. But let's just say he wasn't found by Union troops. <laughs> For the second time in a single day, he was made a prisoner, but he was released in early 1864 as part of a prisoner exchange and continued fighting until the end of the war. Now here's where all that archaeology comes in. A master of self-promotion, Cisnola was made American Consul of Cyprus, then under Ottoman control, by Abe Lincoln himself shortly before he was shot. Cisnola also claimed that Lincoln made him a general, even though he didn't, and while he was consul, he referred to himself as a general, even though he wasn't one. And following the example of other foreign residents in Cyprus, he carried out quote-unquote excavations, often conducted illegally using blackmail, at 50 different sites. These included the important ancient cities of Golgoi, Amathus, and Curion, once the capitals of their own little kingdoms in antiquity. Through these excavations, he amassed a collection of over 35,000 Cypriot antiquities. Can you believe that? You could probably fill up a good-sized pool with all that and swim in it like Scrooge McDuck. But apparently he was a shoddy archaeologist even in his time, and let me tell you, the standards were not high at the time. Cesnola was hardly ever present at his own excavations, he didn't document his findings whatsoever really, uh, and deliberately lied about the significance of the objects he uncovered to boost their prestige. He even lied where they were found, partly because he didn't know where they were found in the first place since he was away so much of the time. So anyways, I'm sure you're keen to know what he did with those 35,000 priceless artifacts. 
Well, he sold most of it, as in 22,000 pieces, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And as a reward, he was made its very first professional director in 1879, two years after his consulship in Cyprus had ended. He would remain in the position until his death in 1904. I don't know what his qualifications were, but I guess having the balls to lead a cavalry charge and being able to accrue literal tons of artifacts sufficed. As director, he led the museum to its current location in Central Park along 5th Avenue. So if you've ever visited it, you have him to thank for any inner city traffic you had to sit through to get there. He also sold other pieces in his collection through high-profile auctions in Paris and London. But he parted with around 5,000 objects from his collection in a particularly interesting way, in that they sunk to the bottom of the sea. Apparently, the Napreed, a ship en route from Beirut to Boston carrying a chunk of Cisnola's collection, burnt up after some rags on it caught fire, and so it sank, taking the antiquities with it to the bottom of the sea. To this day, those 5,000 antiquities are just sitting on the seafloor off Beirut. Uh, I wonder how they uh, managed that explosion recently. But how could his questionable behavior stop there, eh? At least five art critics questioned the authenticity of his pieces by claiming he had made deceptive restorations with them. After all, he did stick limbs and heads onto bodies they didn't belong to with regard to all the uh, limestone sculpture he'd amassed. At one point, as director of the Met, he forced one of his curators to authenticate some of his Cypriot vases, and when the curator had concerns about doing so, Cisnola forced him to resign by locking him out of his own office. Uh, pretty amazing, eh? But despite his exploits in Cyprus, he couldn't tolerate that a piece of art but despite his exploits in Cyprus, he couldn't tolerate that a particular piece of art had been stolen from a church in his native Italy. This particular piece was a vestment presented to a church in the town of Ascoli by 13th century Pope Nicholas IV because Ascoli had been his hometown. It was unwittingly bought by J.P. Morgan, of all people, after it had been stolen, and apparently says Nola helped repatriate it back to Italy, with Morgan presenting it to the Italian government in November of 1904. But later the same month, at the age of 72, Cesnola died. His funeral was attended by 2,000 mourners, a testament to his extraordinary life, and you can find his grave in Valhalla, New York. Cesnola's collection made up the fledgling Metropolitan Museum's primary display of archaeological material, and it was the museum's earliest acquisition of Mediterranean antiquities. The Met still holds approximately 6,000 objects from his collection, and, the, and in the year 2000, a spectacular catalog of 500 pieces from it was published. You can download it for free on the Met's own website, and stumbling upon it is how I came to know about Cesnola's life this week. I, I promise I'm not being sponsored by the Met. I don't think uh, they'd pay me to ad advertise for them. It claims that Cisnola's collection is the richest and most varied representation outside Cyprus of Cypriot antiquities, and that the collection of Cypriot limestone sculpture the Met has, thanks to Cisnola, is the finest and richest in the world, even compared to those of the museums on Cyprus. A lot of 7th and 6th century BC sculpture from Cyprus is very obviously inspired by Egyptian sculpture, which makes sense given that Egypt conquered Cyprus around 570 BC and held it for a few decades, uh, so I'm very tempted to make a video on it. I hope you enjoyed this video, and please like and subscribe to see more videos just like this one. Well, I mean, I'll mainly be covering Egypt, but that's just as interesting 